Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 445 of the podcast and I'm actually recording this a week early as I will be on my way back from Orlando, Florida from Podcast Movement Conference as this goes out. So I will be talking about my lessons learned once I have processed everything. So in this episode, I'm talking to Kat Rose about the creative introvert and how you can design your own ecosystem to reflect your personality, as well as tips on how to pitch for podcast interviews, which is a fantastic form of content marketing these days, especially as Google is now indexing podcasts. So great form of discovery. So as I'm recording this early, I don't have the usual segments because I've just done the usual segments on the last show. (laughs) But I wanted to talk about a really fantastic blog post about day job thinking by Dean Wesley Smith, who continues to be a mentor for me, along with his wife and business partner, Christine Catherine Rush, who've both been on the show a number of times. Now, they have had careers as writers for 30 plus years, navigating all the changes that have come along the way and continuing to make a living with their writing. And this is important because there are many, many voices uh, in this crowded space now. And I'm not saying you have to listen to me, although you are here on the show, so you are listening to me. But the point is, I pay attention to people who have been making a living a good amount of time. (laughs) So if you, if you're hearing things from people who have had very short term success, but have not managed the long term, then perhaps their tactics or what they're doing is a short term tactic. So I think this is very important. So Dean and Chris, to me, I listen to them very, very carefully because they have consistently made a living for years as their business model is sustainable and things go up and down. Technology changes, businesses rise and fall, and their attitudes have kept them in a very uh, good place. So back to Dean's blog post, um, and I'll link to it in the show notes, but if you search Dean Wesley Smith, day job thinking, you'll find it. But essentially, Dean says, day job thinking is, I need a certain amount of money to make my bills this month, and a day job gives it to me in a secure fashion. And that is fine. That's survival thinking. Long-term thinking is the ability of a person to see a ramification of a certain action taken now into the future and maybe even act on the action to increase the value of something in the future. And for for whatever reason, I have had, I always have this long-term thinking. In fact, I'm much better at long-term thinking than I am possibly at short-term thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but I I love the long term. I, I see I often see things a long way out and then I take action and maybe they're useless. For example, um, my German experiment in 2014, I put out several books, I spent money on it, and 2014 was too early to be in German. And now 2019 seems about the right time for me to go back into German. Um, And again, audio, I definitely was early in 2009 with audio, but the long term plan with it, I could have given, I should have given up within six months because nobody listened to this podcast (laughs) in 2009. I mean, very, very few people. Uh, If you were one of them, I love you. You are one of my longest term listeners, but it's very unlikely that you did because very few few people did listen to podcasts. So this long-term thinking can be very difficult. Um, But I get so many questions from writers that imply the short-term thinking, which is, I need immediate cash flow from my writing right now. I get this question so often. What would you do right now if you were starting again and wanted to make a living uh, with your fiction tomorrow? 
And I'm like, uh, well, I don't think you can. I think you need long-term thinking. <laughs> so, um, yes, you need money to survive, but that money might be a day job. It might be other things. A lot of writers teach, a lot of writers do editing, they do services, they do design, they do whatever else they do. I do this podcast is one of my streams of income. But the long-term thinking idea with your writing is all about building assets. So I wanted to challenge you today, do you know what the definition of an asset is? Do you understand why your writing is an asset, why your intellectual property is an asset? And essentially, it's something that you own that can put money in your pocket for the long term. And many people think their house is an asset, but it's not usually. Um, If you own investment property, that might be an asset, but essentially it needs to generate income um, for the long term. And you look after your assets you do the best for them. And your intellectual property, your books can bring you income for the long term. Now, and this is this is the other thing, trying to explain to you traditionally published authors about this. They're like, oh, but I got my advance. And I'm like, yeah, but you might never see any other money. And sure, if you're looking at it as cash flow writing, then getting five grand or 10 grand in your pocket in one go is awesome. But then you have just given, generally given away the rights or licensed the rights to that book, possibly for the term of copyright, which is 50 to 70 years after you die. And I'm like, I think you're bonkers because sure, I might not make five grand or 10 grand in my launch month, but I'm certainly going to make that and much more over the term of copyright. So, but in order to think that you have to know that your book, you have to build a book, you have to build an asset, you have to build a podcast, you have to build a website, whatever you're building so that it does last long term. Uh, So back to Dean, he says, copyright is a form of property. And if you don't do something stupid, like give a traditional publisher all your rights, you get to earn from that property for a very long time. And there's nothing wrong with licensing to a publisher, but please, please, as we've talked about, read your contract. Don't sign something for the life of copyright, um, term limit, and also format limit, country limit, limit your licensing as much as possible. Now, um, yeah, my focus is always on building assets. I, I think I, when I started learning about financial education back in the day when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which must have been about 20 years ago now, um, the, the, he, his, those initial books are still very good. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the second one, The Cash Flow Quadrant, actually has a definition of this, assets generating um, income. And my focus on assets, so not just books, I absolutely, my books are one of my asset classes. Pod, this podcast is an asset. My website is an asset. And in fact, I have had offers for my website because the traffic is, you know, continually growing. It's uh, almost up to 800,000 uniques now and it has a specific community. Um, My new site, booksandtravel.page, I am building that asset for the next 10 years. So if you're still around in 10 years and you're still in the industry, um, I absolutely believe I will still be doing that site. To me, everything I'm doing with books and travel is designed to be long-term income. So the reason I do this is because I never want to go back to a day job. I never want to have someone else deciding what to do with my time. And I remember sitting there towards the end of when I did have a day job and I, I used to, I used to think if I could only use this time on my own stuff, then I could build my own brand, my own business, my own assets. But here I am spending my time building someone else's brand, someone else's asset. And I don't want to do that. So yeah, it might be completely different for you, but I wanted to um, talk about Dean's um, blog post and I'll link to it in the show notes. But yeah, Day Job Thinking by Dean Wesley Smith. Also, Dean has a book. If you don't understand, um, if you don't really understand copyright, and most authors don't, then go read Dean's book, The Magic Bakery, which is great, or go and or go and listen to episode 332, where I interview Dean about intellectual property. So hopefully that is useful. 
OK, so today's show is sponsored by Draft2 Digital and I'll play a word from the lovely Kevin Tomlinson in a minute. Now, um, as I noted last week, draft to digital can help you get into libraries with that paper checkout model as well as onto all the other ebook stores. So definitely check them out if you'd like to publish wide in a super easy manner. This type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons who also get the monthly Q&A audio and you will get the backlist if you sign up to support the show over two years worth of um, extra audio. If so, if you love audio, that might be useful to you. You can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month um, and you can do that at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, here's a word from draft to digital and then we'll get into the interview. Hi, this is Kevin Tomlinson with draft to digital bringing you the D2D smart author tip number nine. When it comes to finding advice and services and tools to help you build and grow your author business, you should be picky. Only take advice from someone who's done what you're trying to do, like certain British authors slash podcasters, but also certain businesses that are built around your needs as an indie author. draft to digital was founded by an indie author and several of our employees are either authors themselves or have worked in the industry for years. We know self-publishing because we are self-publishers just like you. Swing by and learn more about what we've built to help you, including our industry-leading blog full of useful information that can help you build and grow your author career. Start reaching a bigger audience now. Convert your manuscript, distribute it online, and get support the whole way at drafttodigital.com slash pen. Sign up now and get a free author marketing guide, drafttodigital.com slash pen. Happy writing. Kat Rose is an author, podcaster, and creative coach. Her latest book is The Creative Introvert, How to Build a Business You Love on Your Terms. Welcome, Kat. Hi, Joanna. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. So first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. Sure. Well, um, writing has actually always taken a backseat for me um, to visual forms of art. So for all of my life, I've been into drawing. Um, illustration was my dream job for many years until I tried it and actually decided it was better as a hobby than a job for me personally. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until I started blogging in 2013 that I really decided that I loved writing, at least nonfiction. I've never been much of a creative uh, writer, but uh, I basically started blogging because I was reading lots of them um, and I wanted to kind of passive aggressively argue with my boss about veganism. <laughs> and that's basically <laughs> how, how I started blogging. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I blogged in the kind of like health and fitness world for maybe three years before I turned to writing about marketing and basically how to get your art out as a creative introvert. Yeah, um, and-, and yeah, so I've been like loving writing ever since that. And you, uh, you got into doing it full time because you weren't enjoying your job, right? Tell us about how you, how you, uh, how that happened. That's it. Um, yeah, my job was on paper brilliant. You know, I was fresh out of university, um, and I landed a job in, you know, the heart of the West End in London, uh, doing web design and, and a bit of marketing, but for whatever reason, and it wasn't like the colleagues, it wasn't necessarily the clients. It was just the, um, environment I worked out that was not uh, very conducive for me in terms of my productivity or my just general happiness. Um, And it took a few years. I think I stayed there maybe three years. Uh, And this is all around the same time. So I think I quit at a similar time as when I started blogging and started realizing that there is like a whole online world and that freelancing and all of these different opportunities for people working from for themselves was was out there. So I guess, yeah, you found your environment uh, not so happy. And you talk about that in the book. Um, so let's get into mm. introversion. Uh, and I talk about being an introvert a lot on this show. I've been on your show talking about being an introvert. But just in case anyone is unclear, can you define introvert and how it's different to being shy? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, this is a big misconception that people had and actually that I had when somebody said to me, oh, Kat, I think you're an introvert. Uh, I was like, well, I'm not necessarily shy. Um, please explain more. And he did. So the definition that I go on now is based on Carl Jung's work and the Myers-Briggs empire. I mean, it's basically somebody who gets their energy from spending time alone and processes information more slowly and deeply. Uh, and there are other aspects to it, like we don't get the same high dopamine hit, um, which is just like a happy brain chemical that extroverts get from social interaction. Um, so for this reason, a lot of introverts can come across as shy or aloof purely because we don't get like that happy, excited puppy effect from being around people. <laughs> which which I substitute with alcohol. <laughs> uh, right. Yes, that works. Instant extroversion. <laughs> yes. And I must say that's, you know, I think I've used to get that slightly more interested vibe. Uh, you know, that's why I have a drink at events, because I don't think I yeah. can get there otherwise. That's the first time I've heard about the dopamine thing. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it is. And like once I understood that, I kind of stopped beating myself up for being awkward in those social situations and wanting to leave before some of my friends did. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so important. And I think we've, we've both uh, been impacted by Susan Cain's book, Quiet, mm -hmm. uh, which came out, what, must be five, six years ago, maybe even more than that now. And, you know, definitely changed my life because I read that book and I realized, oh my goodness, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. And I think um, that was the first thing my friend pointed me to. Um, and that's kind of when I started looking around me and thinking a lot of these creatives that I, you know, I tried to meet up with, there was a, a, a sort of illustrators meetup group that I used to attend. And again, we were all relying on alcohol to socialize and, and to come across as normal humans. Um, and I realized, Hey, we're all pretty much everyone here is probably an introvert. Um, and that's kind of what started the creative introvert, um, blog essentially. Fantastic. Okay, so let's get into the business model because I, similar to you, I found in my last day, the last day job I had, I was working in an open plan office, a um, couple of hundred people and ended up with migraines. I really suffered. Um, I put on loads of weight because I was like comfort eating all the time. And I just couldn't stand that business model, you know, of, of a day job in an open plan office. And um, so part of the reason I do what I do is be because I'm an introvert, I like being on my own. So let's talk about your thoughts on creating uh, creating a business that works for our personality type? Like what should we keep and what should we throw away? Yeah, well, first of all, it's kind of determining, um, I guess, what your needs are. Um, and I kind of say that this starts just in general with self-knowledge, um, which is not a new concept. People have been studying the self for a very long time. But for me, this is the things like, you know, what your values are, um, what drives you, what scares you, uh, and what environment do you thrive uh, what time of day are you most productive? Um, and there is like loads of information about how you can work these things out online. But I say for a lot of people, it's just experimenting. Like, especially when I started freelancing, I knew it was a test. I knew that this whole working from home thing would be a test and there would be other challenges to it. Uh, and I played around with a lot of things like my schedule, um, where I did work and stuff like that. So it's kind of like a constant process, this thing of like working out, um, uh, what you, you need, um, and how, when, and how are you at your best? Uh, and it can, I mean, there is a line that I realized that you can cross into like self-obsession uh, and the longer that I'm in the self-help space, the more I'm seeing that as a kind of real danger. But for the most part, I do think that most of us could do with a bit more like self-awareness, um, or self, uh, in inquiry, I guess. Yeah. So what did you find in that first year? What um, fears did you tackle and what did you experiment with um, that didn't work or, or ended up working? Yeah, I mean, one thing that I hear a lot of freelancers do, and I was definitely um, victim to this, uh, like my own victim, uh, just working a bit too much um, in those early days or months even um, and working purely from home and sometimes purely from my bed and sometimes not getting out of my pajamas. And that I realized fairly quickly that that was not 
conducive to my health or happiness either. So things like I, I do need to get out of the house to do a bit of work. Um, and I remember we spoke about this before, but going to a coffee shop, like doing a bit of work in a quiet corner of a coffee shop seems to be like particularly conducive to writing. Um, and go on. Oh, I was going to say, I, I absolutely, I write first draft in, in a coffee shop. Um, and, but I have to wear noise cancelling headphones. So it's kind of, it's a bit of both. It's kind of tuning out the noise and I play rain and and thunderstorms, but equally I still like being in an environment where there are people, even though I'm not interacting with the people. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. And it's like, you know, as soon as a you know, a mom with a screaming baby comes in, I'm out, I'm tapping out. That's, that's me done for the day. But in general, it's having that kind of, um, just the right level of stimulation. I think that's it. And, and also just shifting your environment. So I think a lot of creative people thrive, uh, with a level of change. You know, I think if we're just in the same environment all day, which is like an office job, right? That's one of the problems there. Uh, we seem to do better work if we change things up. Yeah. Um, so one of the challenges, I guess, when you're, I mean, you're, you're uh, an author, but you're also a coach and you have clients and a lot of people, when they leave a job, need to do some kind of freelance work. So certainly when I first left, I did more speaking and freelance stuff because uh, I didn't have the recurring income from, from other sources. But f- getting out there and finding clients or finding like and as an illustrator or a freelance writer, that can be challenging for or introverts. So what what did you do in those early days to um, pay the bills? <laughs> yeah, um, a lot of it was continuing on web design, but doing that in a freelance um, way. And that wasn't easy. And I really must say it was because I left my previous job on good terms that I could, you know, occasionally they would throw me a bone. Basically, it's like, hey, we've got some overflow. Um, here's some work. But that that was a big thing for me. It was like, not turning something down because it wasn't as sexy as another job. At that point, I really just had to take everything I could get. Um, and some people will say, no, you know, you have to only take the work that you that you truly love. But really, to pay the bills, I honestly had to do pretty much any crummy design job that I could. Um, and it's only been very recently that I've stopped doing design work. So that's always been the kind of bread and butter for me. Yeah. And it's, yeah, I think you have to have that ramp down of one thing and ramp up of another thing. And that's something that people often don't recognize with the idea of a business model. It's not like, oh, I quit my job and then I make a hundred percent of my money from book sales, for example, that there, mm. there has to be yes. a sort of a changeover period. So how, how long has that taken you to kind of shift into where you want to be? Or are you where you want to be right now? Well, there's, always, always room for improvement. And I mix things up a lot. So, you know, last year, last year, I was particularly focused with creative introvert. But this year, I've stopped um, kind of creating more things like I don't feel the need to create like a new course or a product right now. Um, It's like, for example, continuing on with a league of creative introverts, which again, has grown very slowly over the past, I would say, three years. Um, but I still haven't like hit my goal there either. You know, um, there are definitely a lot of areas which, um, I'm still developing. Uh, and in a lot of ways I'm kind of trading, um, trading my productivity with other lifestyle factors currently. And that's just kind of like a traveling. So I mentioned, um, to you before we started recording that I'm traveling at the moment. So that has kind of taken a bit of a hit on my work output but has definitely like up to the quality of life. So there's always a bit of like a push and pull, I think for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm the same. I need uh, that travel aspect to me is, is filling the creative well. So all the things that yeah. go into your brain while you're traveling and out there experiencing other things, at some point you will bring back and put into your creative work. I'm, I'm sure, although you're probably too busy right now. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 been interesting juggling things, but um, that's another thing that I discovered is that I quite I thrive with a lot of different pro- uh, projects on the go, uh, and we talk about people being um, multi passionate or like having lots of different interests, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, 
as long as you're kind of getting something done in each of those areas. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you obviously, you have your book, The Creative Introvert. And one of the things that I get asked a lot is, how do introverts do book marketing? So what have you found successful for marketing your book? Well, I, I definitely, I even still struggle with self-promotion. Um, this is something that I'm constantly learning about and I teach it partly as a way for me to drill it home to myself and hold myself accountable. So I'm definitely not going to say that I find book marketing easy. Um, but one thing that has helped me, I think, with this particular project is that I'm genuinely proud of the book. Um, and I can't say that about everything or, or even most things that I do. I think that's also a classic introvert thing or a creative thing is that we um, we might be overly humble about something that we've done and that makes it harder to get the word out. And that's kind of like uh, what I started to see is that a lot of us, we know what we have to do to tell people about our book. Um, at the same time, we've kind of got this other voice in us that is, you know, giving us all of these uh, words about, you know, that it's not good enough or that whatever other excuses that we come up with. So for me, it hasn't really been so much the tactics. It's really been repeating to myself that, you know, this is something that I'm proud of and that I can tell people about it. Um, so it's, it's more like the inner work, this, the self-confidence thing as cheesy as that sounds. Um, and that's been really helping me with marketing. Right. But people still want to know about the tactics. So for example, oh, your, yeah, sure. <laughs> let's talk about your, um, your blog. Um, how does blogging sell books for you? Right. So my blog now is, is really more of a podcast, um, with my solo episode, so it's, I'm writing a blog and effectively reading it out uh, and obviously having guests on as well. And that has definitely changed um, my business in the sense that before I started a podcast, I wasn't really selling anything. And about six months into starting the podcast, things started picking up. Um, and so I've really seen that the podcast has helped me massively. Um, I have a weekly newsletter, so that's kind of a great way of keeping in contact with people and that's how I kind of first started talking about the book. Um, something else I did when I first launched the book was I offered a six month um, book club. So after the launch, we, we've been sitting down every month to talk about a different part of the book. Um, and so like definitely when it came to the launch, I was trying to encourage people to get those pre-orders in. And I think that definitely helped. Fantastic. And uh, so how, how did you publish it? Is it traditionally published or self-published? It's self-published. Yeah. Yeah. And that was an interesting experience as well. I remember thinking, you know, if nothing comes of this, at least I've learned the process of getting a book onto Amazon, um, which was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so any lessons learned from that for people listening who might not have done one yet? Uh, don't give up if you get frustrated. Because um, I definitely did. And I've kind of got I thought I'd be fine because I've got a bit of a background with like book design and um, just using software, but I struggled a lot with uh, little formatting issues um, and stuff like that. So honestly, I was trying to find information about that. And I, I really don't think it's a great user-friendly service at the moment. <laughs> I don't know what you think about that. But. I think I think uh, I pay a designer to do to do my design, so I don't do that bit. I just do the uploading. So I think you can make it simpler for yourself. But because you're also a designer, that's probably it. And you do have a lovely design for the book. I think it's it's really good. But I wouldn't recommend most people do design themselves. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and and just I, I guess like figuring out how things work with with. Um, what is it? Is it Kindle Direct Publishing? Yes. Is that what they call it? KDP. Yeah. yeah. So KDP. Yeah. I, I feel like getting your head around that, asking for help if you need to a lot, <laughs> I think is a good um, piece of advice for most people. Yeah. But it's interesting because of course you have a blog, you have a podcast, um, you do illustration and software and things. So you're, you've obviously learned these new skills over time. So coming back to podcasting, for example, many people are scared of mm. podcasting because actually it's got just as much of a learning curve as so say so self-publishing. So um any tips for podcasting um successfully? Yeah, I think 
for sure at the beginning don't um I have a plan have at least like 10 episodes um planned under your belt because I, I see a lot of podcasts start and peter out um or they're not consistent um and I've been pretty consistent from the get-go I think I've had one a week at least since I started um and something else I kind of let myself off the hook for was not having to speak off the cuff because as an introvert I really struggle with that um so having notes really helps and even those first few episodes like I said they were existing blog posts that I basically read aloud. Um, so definitely make it easy for yourself as much as possible. Um, and editing, editing is something that I still do and I'm not quite, quite sure why because I could easily hand that off to somebody else. Um, but it's, it, again, it's like picking out the parts of podcasting that you, um, that are not in your wheelhouse and, and trying to hire it out. And sites like Upwork have been really helpful for, for odd bits like that. Yeah, absolutely. And then one of the things, I mean, I still get like heart palpitations before I call someone. I am not someone who enjoys calling. And also I don't like pitching. And in fact, I, um, uh, you know, you helped me with some pitching uh, yeah. for, for a while. Uh, so why why do introverts struggle with pitching? And, and what are some tips if uh, listeners, probably more listeners would like to get on podcasts than would start their own? So any tips for pitching? Uh, for a yes. podcast interview well yeah I've, I've I've learned definitely how not to pitch from the kind of pitches I, I receive myself and I'm sure you've received hundreds and hundreds of pitches that are not particularly thoughtful so I think in the first place um really get to know and love the podcast that you're pitching um that that does help like I think a lot of people will write to me and they won't have used my name or call me something strange like hey team the creative introvert and I'm like oh come on it's clear that I'm not a team <laughs> um but anyway it's 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 lots of little things like that um make it easy for the host so something that I do is I will bullet point the speaking points that I can speak about uh and try to match them with your um the podcast hosts you know uh, that their show and what you think that they might need or find useful, or at least what their audience would. Um, so definitely it's like kind of taking your time with that. Uh, and that doesn't mean you can't have a template. Like you can have, um, uh, you know, if you have like a, sh a very, very short bio, like one paragraph, you might want to put that at the end of the, of the end of the pitch. Um, but always start with something personal as a rule of thumb. Um, and in terms of like the mindset around that, because I think that's the other part. Like I said, you know, you can write an email, but actually hitting send is another matter. Um, so it's forgetting about the, the reply or even the res any kind of response really, because in, in a lot of cases you won't get one. So like preparing for that in advance, um, and kind of seeing it as, um, I think there was like a, a game I used to play with myself that I learned from somebody else, which is how many no's can I collect today? So like, without being like too negative about it it's like just going for it without um focusing too much on getting the answer that you want just try to send those emails um uh and at the same time don't overwhelm yourself like uh i've definitely learned that it's better to send you know one or two a day rather than try to do like 20 in one day yeah. And it's, it's funny because, um, you know, I feel like half the time I start things myself because I don't want to pitch. So I, you know, I know I'll start a podcast myself mm. and then eventually people will just pitch me. And that's essentially what has <laughs> happened for me is, you know, generally I get pitched to be on podcasts or to go and speak without having to do that. Um, and I guess in the same way with self-publishing, you don't have to get rejected by anyone because you're just in, con yeah. in control of your own stuff. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. So um, one of the, you did mention the uh, League of, uh, what was it? League of Creative C Introverts. Creative Introverts. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And community is really important. But um, I find networking conferences uh, are ex exhausting, absolutely exhausting, um, but also necessary in some way. So let's just talk about um, networking in person or events in person. What can introverts do to um, do them <laughs> without dying, basically? 
Yeah, yeah. Stay at home. No, I'm kidding. Um, first of all, it's, I think, getting clear on why you want to go to the to the event in the first place. Um, I think a lot of us kind of, you know, if if we don't really see the purpose of it, it's it's really hard to kind of remind ourselves why we're going through the, you know, the, the anxiety beforehand. But, you know, get, get your reasons why, um, you know, if there's something that you want to talk about to people or um, specific people that you want to meet, that's all going to be a lot more helpful. Uh, and in advance, try to find out as much as you can so you know what to expect. This is something that has really helped me because I think, and it's not necessarily related to introversion, but I think a lot of us do suffer with some level of social anxiety. And part of that is just the uncertainty of, you know, what, what's going to, what's this event going to be like? Um, so, you know, if, if you can get in touch with the organizer and ask any questions that you have in advance, you know, do do that. Um, the other thing that I found helpful is trying to, if you can find out people who are attending, um, which I'm finding is happening more and more. Like I used to sign up for events on Eventbrite and uh, other services. And often you can get in touch with um, attendees. Um, and the advantage of that is that you'll have somebody to talk to that you can kind of scope out um, when you first get to the conference. And this happened to me recently. I, um, I was put on a, a room sharing list at a big conference. And that was really great because my roommate was awesome. And, you know, was a, we were kind of a tag team for the conference, which really helped me. Um, and then when you are, like, if you, you do get yourself into a conversation with somebody who you really wanted to speak to, um, I would recommend focusing your, atten uh, your attention and your energy on them, you know, asking good questions rather than um, stressing out about pitching them. So that way you can kind of basically make it about them. And I think that really goes a long way, uh, even subconsciously when you're talking to somebody, if they're, if, if you're the one doing a lot of listening, which a lot of introverts are more comfortable with, um, that's not a bad thing. Uh, and then you can follow up with them the next day, which definitely do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd probably add two more things. One is, uh, set intentions, in writing. Mm. I mean, I, I, everyone's a writer on the show. So, you know, writing down what you want to achieve from that event, because I feel like yes. uh, as our introvert brains go deep in one area and the overstimulation can make it really hard. So if you write down your intentions, that will help you tune out the things that don't uh, serve you. Obviously be open to serendipity, but for example, I will sure. make sure that the sessions I go to are about, you know, or working towards my intention, for for example. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's what I meant with like getting clear on why you're going. Um, but I love the idea of writing it down because that kind of makes it more real, doesn't it? Yeah. I th and I think there I'm, I'm almost writing it as an affirmation. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I write in that kind of positive forward thinking way like um you know and I, I use gratitude as well I don't often talk about this actually but I'll say you know um thank you for the opportunity to meet someone who will help me do x and yes you know really so, just look at it that way so you're being grateful before the thing has happened yes so I, that is I guess an that, affirm I love affirmation that. Yeah, yeah. I, I really love attaching gratitude to that. That sounds really helpful. Yeah, yeah it really. And it, I also do that before I speak um, in public. I've talked about that in my book on public speaking, but I always I write like a whole page of thank you that everything's going really well. And thank you that people really thank enjoy you. my talk. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for the standing ovation. <laughs> yeah, so th thank you for all the money that's going to arrive. <laughs> but it's not it's not a prayer in that way. It's like a, it's just a, an affirmation. But then the other more, I guess, uh, practical thing, like you mentioned um, the guest list. I mean, I will often um, use Twitter um, or the Twitter hashtag. There's usually a Twitter hashtag for an event. And if you find people's Twitter handles in advance, um, first of all, you can have a look at um, have a look at their website, see what they're up to. Um, and you can potentially tweet them beforehand. Um, I mean, I really like that because it means people might come up to me actually and say, oh, I saw you on Twitter and, you know, I, I, I see what you do. So that almost as an yeah. introvert, I much prefer people coming up to me than going up to other people. 
Yes. And it's like having an excuse as to talk to somebody. Uh, I think a lot of us struggle with that, that first introduction, but at least with Twitter or however you found somebody, you've kind of, you've got a hook, you've got something to say. Yeah. And I think the other thing about introverts, apparently, is that we don't like small talk, which is really funny. And I only, when I read um, The Quiet by Susan Cain, I kind of discovered that. And it, and I found myself like talking to people about, uh, have they got, you know, um, things, have they done their will? You know, the first conversation I've ever talked to someone and it's about <laughs> death. <laughs> Sort of okay, you know, you need to get some small talk going, you know. But it's good one if you know what people do beforehand, then you you have a topic that is more interesting than just small talk. Well, that's it. That's it. Yeah, no, small talk is um painful, and uh, the quicker I can get to the juicy stuff, like the the (laughs) better. better. (laughs) Um, Okay, so uh, you do have um, a really interesting, actually on your website as well as as the book, but uh, a thing about many creatives fail to make a living doing what they love for various reasons. So what are some of those reasons that creatives fail? Yeah, and I feel like there are many, but um, one that, that springs to mind is persistence um because it, it's hard right like it's it's if everyone could make a living doing what they love you know they would but naturally we we won't love every single thing we do um and honestly i don't love every part of my business um but the payoff i think has to be worth the challenge uh so you know f- for me it's that feeling i get if i do go on on stage like that's worth the anxiety beforehand um, and I think a lot of people don't get to the point where they've identified what that payoff is. Um, and again, going back to what I was saying about self-knowledge, like you can work these things out. Um, it just takes some experimentation and that takes persistence. So just kind of keeping going, I think, is is one of the hardest parts of it, really. Um, and and yeah, I through experimenting, I found a bunch of things that I loved in order you know, which I wouldn't have found if I just thought uh, building a pet portrait business was my, like, that was the only way I could have a business that I loved. Uh, It turns out that that wasn't what brought me joy. And that these really unexpected things brought me joy, like podcasting. Yeah. And it's, um, I mean, you talk about building a business you love. Uh, So this is not just, I mean, yes, have a life you love, but the fact of a business is, as you say, there are things that you won't love. I mean, uh, I've been going through my year end, you know, with my accountant and I love money, but, and I love, you know, working out all of that, but I don't particularly love going through all the paperwork and finding all the receipts and (laughs) doing all of that kind of thing. And I feel like, um, one of the reasons that creatives fail is because they don't do the stuff that is not creative. Um, and they, Mm. they feel that, if you're going to have a creative business or a creative life, then you shouldn't be doing that type of thing or working out how to use KDP or going through the frustration of something technical because that's not creative. So do you, do you think that, do you think it's sort of not learning the well practical stuff? Completely. And like, and while doing that stuff, so yeah, when I was banging my head against the wall with KDP, I had to keep reminding myself of, what would be the end result, which would be having published my first book all by myself, which I really, I could kind of get into that feeling place and be like, yes, I I want this. Um, This is worth it. Um, So that's kind of what I mean about like getting to the, to the nubbin, the thing that is, is bigger than the struggle Um, and kind of reminding yourself of that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, tell us about what, your business looks like right now. So what business model do you have? What are your multiple streams of income? So the League of Creative Introverts is the online membership community. So this is a monthly paid subscription. Uh, So that's kind of like the core of the creative introvert. Uh, Then I've got the coaching side of things. So that's one-to-one conversations with people. Um, And I sell a few products like t-shirts, other designs, uh, using Redbubble, which, you know, I, there could be a, def- a better solution to that, but Redbubble is doing fine right now for me. Um, and then there's the book. Uh, as for speaking, 
um, that's like as and when I can. I haven't been doing much of that in the recent months, but I'm sort of still kind of getting my chops up with that. But ultimately, I would like to be doing the kind of paid speaking rounds and um, and workshops. Workshops are something that I started doing uh, when I moved out of London and I moved to Brighton. And that community seemed really uh, conducive to kind of holding workshops and um, getting involved there as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think so often, again, creatives fail because they think that they will just do the one thing. You know, they'll just yeah. have the one book or they'll be an illustrator or, and they won't have to do different things. But I love that you're uh, doing multiple things right now, but you're, you've also got plans for future stuff, which is great because I feel like there are there are a lot of introvert speakers, by the way, because it's actually easier mm. being on the stage than it is in a crowd. <laughs> yes. A hundred percent. So I think that's, that's fantastic. Okay. So where can people find your book and everything you do online? Well, everything is at the creative Um, and I guess if you search for the creative introvert on Amazon or that's pretty much where I'm selling it now, unfortunately, I'd love to have it in, in stores, but not yet. Um, and say hello to me on Twitter or Instagram at creative intro. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Kat. That was great. Thanks for speaking to me. So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Kat today and that it gave you some ideas for making your creative business work for your personality type. So next week, I'm talking about navigating changes in the publishing industry with Mike Shatskin, who is a very well-known publishing consultant in the traditional publishing arena. And I pick his brains on Barnes & Noble, Amazon Publishing, and the biggest changes, uh, unexpected changes that have happened over the last 10 years and what might be coming next. So Mike has over 50 years experience in publishing. And I've been reading his blog since I started out. So I was thrilled to have him on the show. And it shows you how much times have changed because, first of all, he knew of me as well, which I found quite thrilling. But also he was happy to come on. And, you know, he's pretty respectful, I think, about independent authors and self-publishing and is a fan of companies we are like Ingram Spark. And just generally, it's that has changed because even five years ago, he probably would not have come on my show. (laughs) So very, very interesting. That is coming next week. Happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.